In this episode of Travelogue, we reach the end of our epic 10-part journey along the Pearl River. We discover the many ways in which the millions of people living among the mountains of Yunnan province at the river's source are preserving their traditions. The Pearl River, known in Chinese as the Zhujiang, with its eastern, western and northern tributaries, it's actually a vast river system, the third longest river in China and the second largest by volume. Near its source is the city of Chujing and neighboring Luoping County. So here we are, the final leg of our journey towards the source of the Pearl River. Although here it's known by many different names, but still for centuries the local ethnic Bui people have harnessed the power of the Pearl River using their water wheels to irrigate their fields. And of course, if you look from further high up, you'll see an uh, entire area surrounded by beautiful fields of rapeseed, for which this county is famous for. I'm Turan, welcome to Yunnan province and welcome to Chuting. Out of China's three great river systems, the Pearl is the only one whose source can be easily reached. Starting from Yunnan province in the southwest of the country, its headwaters must travel almost two and a half thousand kilometers, roughly the distance from London to Moscow, before reaching the ocean. Here in Luoping County, many of the Pearl's tributaries converge to form the Nanpan River, the lifeblood of the local economy. So this is all pretty novel for me. At first I thought there were cow sheds, but uh, as it turns out, they're basically automated pestle and mortars. And as we've seen with other ethnic minorities who live by the Pearl River, water is incredibly important. And for the Buyi people too, water is something that they always have to live nearby. It not only feeds their lands, you know, waters their crops, but also provides a source of energy uh, if you harness it using water wheels. For example, here they have these big hammer arms that lift up and slam down on things like sweet corn if you want them grounded, or if you want a whole rice, you'll chuck them in here, wait for the water to do its work, and just sit back and relax, really. Well, depending on the speed of the water. Ethnic Buyis have been living in these parts for over a thousand years. No doubt they found the area idyllic, but the attraction has its practical side too. This is the Doyi River, a branch of the Nanpan, which waters a highly fertile valley. Believe it or not, it's dry season right now. Yet there's plenty of H2O to go around. This may look like a selection of exotic spices, but it's actually just sticky rice. The colors are extracted from the diverse flowers and plants that grow here in Luoping County's lush climate. Man, would you look, this is intense. I mean, we got up at 5.30 in the morning to film the sunrise and obviously it was dark back then. I had no idea there'd be so many photographers here. Uh, I knew that the rapeseed fields of Luoping were famous. I didn't realize how popular they'd be. Um, but unfortunately, lots of clouds today. So sun's already up, didn't get the sunrise, but it's still pretty nonetheless. And it doesn't really matter for me because I don't have a tripod. So win-win. <laughs> The 
grapeseed fields here cover an area the size of Chicago. Once a year, in early spring, the plants explode into a profusion of gold. And Luoping becomes the backdrop for an international flower festival. And for a thriving industry. Feels so pretty, but these rapeseed flowers aren't just about the looks either. They're the third largest source of vegetable oil in the world. They give us canola oil, for example, and China is the second biggest producer of them. But um, every year they only bloom between the months of February and March, and during that time, three million visitors come here to Luoping County in order to take photographs of these little yellow flowers. The shutterbugs aren't the only creatures drawn to the blossoms. Among the others are some insects that are rather more productive. Hey, okay. Oh, okay. That's very kind of them. We've got a yes. <laughs> I definitely want one of these babies. Don't actually know if I'm allergic to bees because I've never been stung before. But. Uh, this is just for the face. I don't care if my hands are going to be stunned. <laughs> put my hands in my pocket. But I think I think you guys should probably also put the hats on. No, no. Okay, you're a brave cameraman. <laughs> Oh,就直接从那个这个碗啊，给摇出来是吗？哇哇哇哇哇！对，它这封面叫蜂蜡笔碗啊，就是下边这个黑色的这块是吗？这就是白的，是封面。白的是封面，黑的反正不是。黑
you know, I think it goes without saying that most vegetable oil uh, in the world is produced in factories today. Um, you know, because we've seen how difficult it is to hand make the thing. So then, why do people still do it? Uh, here's the thing, I like the cold, dead steel of machinery. Um, Chinese people believe there is life to be found in things like wood, in plants like grass. And when you hand make something, you're adding your own warmth to it too, which means the end result should be better and uh, hopefully quite a lot tastier too. The traditionalist in me is delighted to see that they're working to preserve the ancient craft for future generations. But I guess the healthy eater in me is also pleased by the natural production process. Coming up next, I spy with my little eye one of China's most beloved birds, and I learn how a very ordinary metal brought extraordinary riches to a small mountain town. Look at this. But you know what we're here for? We're turning into a bunch of regular amateur photographers, aren't we? Uh, up at five in the morning for the sunrise again, but this time with good reason because oh, we're here to film the black neck cranes who tend to take off after sunrise. This is Huizhou County's Black Neck Crane Nature Reserve. As the world's only alpine crane species, they're able to reach incredible altitudes, high enough to cross the Himalayas. Black neck cranes are revered in Buddhist culture. The Chinese consider them a symbol of fidelity. They pair for life, and during mating season they put on a beautiful dance. All in all, it's a magnificent spectacle. One that might just be the subject of an award-winning photograph. Onions. See, one of the best things about Travelog is uh, you always get to eat so many different kinds of foods. And breakfast is actually one of my favorite meals, if I can get up in time for it. Um, but we've got some fried dough sticks and uh, what looks like a great big bowl of condensed milk, but is actually made of peas. This gloopy thing is actually... It's actually pretty good, quite savory. And, um, <laughs> very much tastes like peas. <laughs> but once you've got a nice breakfast down, you can spend the rest of the day chilling out. It's just a good start to the day. The bustling town of Huizhou seems worlds away from the peace and quiet of the nature reserve. Unlike other more airbrushed ancient towns, this one feels authentic. Even the chaos is refreshing. The streets are full of people going about their business, which harks back to a time when Huizhou was a thriving copper mining town.
一般哪种铜能出花斑呢？必须是铜里面含有几种微量的贵金属。我们最原始的就是用自然铜锻造出来的，放药水里面就出斑，那个叫生斑。这一件呢，是我。用自然铜和纯铜融合在一起之后做出来的，嗯、我们叫熟斑啊，然后就放在这个药水里。对，这个药水是我们祖传的一个秘方，<笑>它里面有植物的成分，<笑>有,有,植,物分<笑>有植物的晶体液，还有矿石的原料。但是具体什么你不会跟我说的。<笑>对对对对对，这个是保密的。我们最近做了有十几代了，是吗？到我这一代应该是十三代了。这个药水也一直传了十三代了，是吧？嗯，传了十三代，而且每代人都对它进行了改进提升。每次下去的时候，你会知道它会出哪种斑吗？这个就是我控制不了的，这个就相当于它里面的金属含量高低、结晶大小，这个都是随机的，就是天然的、自然形成的。哦、这个像打赌似的。哎，对对对，<笑>我们这个以前他们也叫的就像赌铜，我把它放进去。哦，您为什么想做这个铜器啊？那毕竟是很累的活。我也是大学毕业之后。呃，才利用来从事这一项行业、嗯。如果我不传承的话，就觉得就很可惜了。嗯。呃，这个是我们祖辈的一种智慧的结晶、嗯，也是我的一种责任吧，要把它传承下去。对。所以我上大大学的时候学的专业也是冶金，啊、嗯，跟这个也相关，啊、嗯。不能断掉。Zhang Wei combines the intuition and skills inherited from his forebears with the methodical approach of a modern scientist. He's found the best of both worlds, and there's no questioning the originality of his work. Every piece is mesmerizing, and no two are the same. I mean, it really is incredibly intricate, and I think possibly one of the the most fun things about doing this is you, is you really don't know what the end result is going to look like. You, you really do have to just sit and pray. Obviously, there's some ex expertise in there, but it's all about luck. 其实它是什么？它是不同的角度，它会有不同的色彩。Huizer's relationship with copper has been long and prosperous. And yet, the weather-beaten streets and houses tend to belie this place's claim to once being one of the richest towns in China. Pretty uh, impressive. You can always tell from artwork whether a place is wealthy, actually. And uh, from the early Qing Dynasty, roughly 400 years ago, this place was producing copper. And at one point, 70% of all of the copper coins in circulation during Imperial China was produced from the mines here in Huizhou, which obviously made a lot of people very wealthy. And uh, that's why you find so many of these merchants' guild halls here. 108, in fact, which is a lucky number in Buddhism, too. But only eight of them remain today. And the best preserved is the Jiangxi Guildhall, with its crowning glory, this elaborately decorated stage. You know, I really do quite like the stage, and not just because it's beautiful, but if you have a look at the couplets, the characters written on both sides, uh, of the plaques here, their meaning is actually pretty Shakespearean. It says, all the world's a stage, heaven cares not for your wealth, and the only difference between a rich man and a poor man is the quality of his clothing. All men and women are merely players. Well, I added that last line in, but you get the picture. <laughs> Then again, you might say the only difference between a rich man and a poor man is the quality of his lifestyle. 
In that case, even though Huizhou has lost some of its former glory, its people today are still pretty well off. Coming up next, I discover a competitor to prosciutto and Iberian ham, thousands of miles away from Europe in a tiny Chinese mountain village. Continuing our journey towards the source of the Pearl River, we reach Xuanwei County, the location of the highest bridge in the world. Here, the Pearl River's main tributary is the Beipan River, a historically important transportation route once used by the hill tribes who lived here. Well, this is very quaint, isn't it? So, uh, there's about a two hour drive through the mountains to reach this place, Panjaga Village, which is mainly known for two things for its stone buildings um, and also its cured ham, its hamon, which is great for me because you know, I'm a bit of a big meat eater. Wow,这些火腿,感觉真的有点像在西班牙似的,很奇怪的感觉。这个就是去年东岳份我们才制作的,就是才几个月的那种新鲜的火腿。这个通过发酵两年以后,它就深度发酵以后就长这种绿霉
，小白杖是一个给大家。看一下，呃，这是我们村的微信公共账号“攀枝嘎特色小站”。然后进去之后呢，有三个菜单。然后从这个菜单，然后点进去有一个那个来养猪。哦。啊，对，这是一个 A P P。很可爱啊。啊啊。那就消费者呢，他是可以在这个 A P P 上认养我们村的这个土猪的那个。我们每个村中，每家每户，然后在他们家养猪的那个猪舍前面都安了摄像头。他可以通过视频，可视化的这种方式啊，互联网这种工具呢，可以查看他养的猪。这个很可，这就有点像游戏似的了，嗯，非常可爱。对，这个我们就可以实现那个，呃，消费者直接呃直接从透明化这个，相当于是从通过互联网就可以看到我们生产者是怎样生产食物的那个。嗯、比如像我们这个火腿那个，啊、呃，我们现在呢是把它做成这样的一个形式，嗯，呃。可以通过消费者可以、哦、直接可以通过咱们这个 A P P 就买了。对对对对，而且我们包装上都是有那个二维码的那个，你只要一扫，然后就可以下单，你不用从这直接带着回家，我们可以直接快递到家里面。哦，这就一下解决这个嗯路程的问题了。对对对对，所以是很方便的那个。嗯。It's all about keeping traditions alive in a modern world. Just as the copper master and oil producers we met earlier are doing. This part of eastern Yunnan may seem quite isolated, but the people here are anything but close-minded. The source of the Pearl River. I mean, it really is incredible to think that over some 2,400 kilometers, this river first becomes a raging underground torrent that literally carves out the earth beneath our feet before surfacing and becoming a vast network of tributaries on which the livelihoods of hundreds and thousands of people rely on for food, for agriculture, for farming, for transport and power. And also for thousands of enterprising merchants who set out for the wider world on the Maritime Silk Road, it was a source of great fortune. But it's also been a pretty incredible journey for us too. I mean, we've seen the mega metropolises at the mouth of the Pearl River and the tiny little ethnic minority villages nearby its source, and how this incredibly complex river system has created some of China's most enduring landscapes, traditions, cultures, and cuisines, and continues to change the face and fate of China, and perhaps even the wider world. This vast river system, with its history, is connected to the million-strong Chinese diaspora, and with its modern cities standing on the Maritime Silk Road, it's connected to every corner of the globe.